welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this inaugural, for the first session, uh, Startup Nation Japan. And, um, you know, the origin of this is actually very straightforward. About two months ago, um, I was on a panel discussion with a bunch of very, very serious economists. And we were talking about Japan. And I had to sort of pinch myself and shake my head because the discussion effectively could have been held five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. Macroeconomists talking about Takano-san monetary policy and the effectiveness. I mean, you know, all this stuff you know, doesn't really seem to work to get the country going. And you know, it is important to point out that actually it's not monetary policy, it's not fiscal policy, but it is entrepreneurship that actually gets economic growth going. And I've done a little bit of work here, and you see that the bigger the share of entrepreneurs in a national economy, the greater the potential growth rate, right? And of course, you can see that you know, on this sort of chart here, the United States is obviously doing a very good job. The top point at the far right-hand corner is Israel, very, uh, very successful. And you do see that Japan is, um, well, chuto hampa. Right? Um, neither here nor there, although I do always have to point out, Kenji, that Germany is better than uh, France, you know, when it comes to these sort of things here. But the key point being, when we talk about the future of an economy, what should the government do? Number one, it should actually create a better environment for entrepreneurship. In Japan, you also do this do see this, that it is young companies that actually create jobs. Over the last, um, you know, basically 10 years, you find that companies younger than five years old have actually created about two million jobs, while older companies have been net destroyers of jobs. Now, when you look at the Japanese environment, you do see that, yes, you know, there is some new formation, about 5% of the entire corporate stock you know, gets created um, every year, but you see that that's far below what you've got in the United States or in Germany. And now we come to the panel, because you do actually see that venture capital, new startups funded by venture capital funds, is actually growing very, very nicely in Japan, but again, in the international comparison, last year, you know, about 1,900 companies were invested in by venture capital firms. But you see in the United States, that's 12,000 companies. So there's a big gap that's going through. But there is movement. And to explain what that movement is, I thought we'd talk to some of the movers and shakers in that field. And Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jesper, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul McInerney. I'm uh, actually a little new to this game. I uh, joined a venture fund called Incubate Fund in March this year. However, going back 20 years, I've been involved in the venture space in Japan. I'm originally from Australia. You can probably tell from the accent. Uh, but I've been in Japan about 30 years. I did my law degree here. Uh, I spent five years at a company called Recruit, which is now uh, Japan's top uh, internet-related company by market cap. And after that, I spent 18 years at McKinsey and & Company. And uh, just as of March this year, I joined uh, Incubate Fund. Uh, I thought I'd just take uh, two or three minutes to talk about um, just the macro picture, uh, continuing on from uh, Jesper's thoughts. Uh, the first, if you look at uh, total capital invested in venture companies over the past year, it's about $4.3 in Japan. US was roughly $164 billion in the same year. Uh, the first half of this year, there's been a dramatic acceleration in the US. Uh, the latest numbers from the NVCA is 150 billion in the first half of this year. Japan's not accelerating at that pace, I can assure you that. But, uh, so there's a large scale difference. Uh, the growth over the past 10 years has been largely driven by larger uh, equity rounds. So on average, companies are now doing an additional round before going public. I'll come back to companies going public in a moment because there's a really positive story there. Uh, and if you look at recent investments, global players are getting heavily involved, KKR, Light Street. Uh, more recently, for our um, incubate funds, uh, uh, companies we've had interest from Tyborn uh, and Tiger. So you're seeing a lot of positive interest globally in, in the Japanese ecosystem. I think from here you'll see a rapid acceleration in capital committed involvement from overseas. Uh, 
really interesting sort of quirk in all of this is if you look at the, the scale of venture capital invested, there's at least a 4x delta and probably widening. If you look at the number of IPOs, Japan versus US, the gap isn't as big as you'd think. It's only about a factor of 2x. In some years, it's even close to equal. And so in Japan, you have a lot of much smaller scale, but I would posit very high quality uh, exits through IPOs. m and is much less common in Japan. So I go back one. Uh, and then uh, another sort of another sort of straightening a little bit of a myth about Japan is that uh, um, people talk about Japan having not many unicorns, perhaps seven over the past decade. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a, a misread of the data. If you look at the post-IPO pop on day one, it's about a 40% pop in Japan versus about 6 to 12% in the US. So if you count the day after the IPO, which I think is fair to count, um, the number is closer to 25 uh, unicorns, which is roughly equivalent to uh, Europe, for example. A long way behind the US, but nevertheless quite competitive. So I think you've got a lot of very high quality venture companies. You've got an increasing flow of talent into venture companies in Japan right now. I was at McKinsey for 18 years. Over the last seven years, I'd, I would say that it'd be fair to say about half of the colleagues who leave, which is about 150 each year, uh, go into venture companies now. It used to be private equity, uh, pharmacos, you know, companies. So I think you've got a really nice inflow of talent, inflow of capital, a lot of positives uh, going forward. We obviously have a scale issue, as, as Jesper said, though. Uh, final uh, thought is, as I said before, if you include unicorns fudging the data just a little bit, adding a day, uh, you have companies across healthcare, deep tech, AI, social gaming, SARS, and then others such as Mercari. Mercari's done very well uh, with their efforts in the US recently, so the market cap's now just south of uh, 10 billion. Um, and if you look at uh, companies' performance post-IPO, it's also very positive. So I think, you know, much smaller scale, uh, but very positive trajectory. And just a final comment uh, on the macro environment. Recently, we've been fundraising uh, for a growth fund, and I've been working with uh, some of the big universities in the US uh, to see if they'd be interested in investing, and also a lot of family offices globally. And the level of interest in Japan is huge right now. They're, they're curious about making their allocations for the first time, and it's a virtual cycle. The larger the investments, the more the big investors are able to allocate to Japan, and they're interested in doing so. So finally, uh, just a quick comment on Incubate Fund, a little bit of a, uh, a, little bit of a pitch. <laughs> Uh, Incubate Fund is one of Japan's uh, older uh, venture capital setups. We've been in, in operation for 10 years. Uh, we're Japan, I think it's fair to say we're a, Japan's leading seed stage investor, so we, we spend a lot of time creating companies, um, less in Series A, Series B. Uh, performance over the past decade has been top quartile globally uh, against uh, Prequin benchmarks. And uh, if you exclude me and you take my four colleagues, uh, GPs, uh, they have an aggregate of about 95 years of experience investing in seed companies. So their track record is obviously what makes it a lot easier to attract foreign uh, LP interest. Uh, by the numbers, uh, we've uh, got five companies in the top 50 by value, uh, private companies, 175 portfolio companies. What we're probably most excited about is we have about 20 IPOs in the pipeline over the next three years, so we're going to be very busy. And uh, the size of those IPOs will grow over time. We're seeing the, the growth rounds much bigger. Uh, far fewer M&As than you'd expect in, in a US context, and that's common for Japan. Um, and uh, to the job creation point, I think that's an important one. We take pride in you know, 15,000 jobs created, and that's something we do look at carefully and, uh, as, as we're investing. So uh, that is a little bit of the macro picture and does it incubate fund. Great, uh, Paul. One, one question on the 26 yep. M&A. Is this domestic domestic or is it uh, uh, foreigners buying into Japan? It's, hot, it's almost all domestic domestic. Uh, the buyers, importantly, though, are almost uh, former venture companies, if you will. So no, it's the venture companies that have gone public. And I, I'd love to get people's thoughts on that topic is that unless the Japanese big incumbents get more comfortable with acquisitions, I think that exit path will be limited. But I think for Japanese companies trying to innovate, it's a must do. If you look at Recruit, their $1 billion of acquisition of Indeed in 2012 is now worth roughly $27 billion. So big moves like that, I think, are important. Excellent overview. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, I pass the baton to Kathy. First of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, I, along with my two partners, Yumiko Murakami and Miwaseki, we launched Empower Partners uh, Global VC Fund at the end of May. Uh, I left 
a 30-year career in uh, cell-side research, um, where I was most recently with Goldman. And many people have asked, why on earth are you doing what you're doing? It doesn't seem like a natural extension of what I was doing before. And one very good friend uh, um, and a college mate of mine said, you shouldn't do VC, Kathy. It's really hard. It's really terrible. You should do uh, activist hedge fund. Because for, you know, if you know a little bit about my background in research, I started my career at the absolute worst time you could start your career being a Japanese equity strategist, which was at the peak of the market in 1990. And so therefore I had a lot of time, and Takuna-san and I worked together at Goldman, a lot of time trying to figure out what was wrong with Japan, especially from the vantage point of corporate Japan, especially looking at issues such as um, not global standards of corporate governance, uh, lack of diversity uh, in topics such as that. So you can understand why this friend said you should do activist um, uh, hedge fund investing because you worked with public companies, um, you could push these companies around, get them to do the right thing. And I said, after about five seconds of thought, I know I could do that, <laughs> and I probably could raise some money to do that, but would I jump out of bed every morning saying, I want to do that, was a very different matter. And my husband, Jesper, uh, who's my sort of sounding board through this whole process, just, I just came around to the conclusion that, while that was sort of the natural thing I could do, I wouldn't find joy in doing that. And rather, I'd been doing a little bit of angel investing on the side, for a few years, I love speaking with entrepreneurs. Um, just as was you know, highlighted already, I see that the evolution of Japan's venture market is a very exciting inflection point today that I think the rest of the world just doesn't know about. And I suffered from this for 30 years covering the Japanese stock market. <laughs> like Nobody wanted to you know, know about Japan. Uh, and much less the venture world, you know, what is it about? And I spoke to one of those global investors on Paul's slide, and they are invested in Japanese startups. And I said, how did you even find these companies? He said, well, it was really difficult. We basically screened for the startups that had English information. And there were like three, and this was one of the three. I said, wow, maybe, you know, there's some work that we could do to introduce uh, these really exciting companies uh, to the rest of the world. Um, the feature, though, about our fund, uh, other than that we're all female, and that was not you know, by design, it just happened to be uh, that way, is that we are ESG uh, aligned or focused. And the reason for that is because, again, in my sell side job, trying to work with companies on improving their governance, improving their diversity, improving their social you know, impact, et cetera. It was frankly very hard to convince old dogs new tricks. And we felt that, well, we have the background, my partners and I, in governance, in diversity, why not take what we know and we've experienced and help younger companies, not when they're adults, but when they're teenagers, to integrate these principles and values of good governance, of diversity, of knowing what their environmental impact is on the world. So when they go public, and when they face the scrutiny of public markets, hopefully they'll have an easier time. And for us, the important thing is there's a lot of what they call greenwashing these days about ESG. You just tick off some boxes, make those rating agencies happy, and you've passed the test. There's a lot of scrutiny, especially from the regulators, about this today. So we don't want this nanchara ESG kind of um, approach, but we want to help our portfolio companies genuinely improve the areas of the E, the S, and the G where they think they are weak, and we will partner with them to help them improve in those specific areas. Now, this is not something that can be fixed in a week or a month or a year. This will be a multi-year um, exercise for, for the, the companies and, and for us. So that's kind of the overall thesis 
of M power. And by the way, M stands for the first in, uh, initial letter of our uh, three founding partners' maiden names, Matsui, Murakami, and uh, Matsuo. And all three of our parents, um, we are daughters of entrepreneurs ourselves. And we've all, for the maybe for our careers, working for large companies, felt really in the deep recesses of our hearts, maybe someday we could follow the path uh, of our parents and do something um, on our own as well. Thank you. Can you, say, can you say a little bit about the fund, uh, sort of where, where you are in the fundraising and all of that? I can say a little bit. Um, so we're targeting 150 million US dollars and we thought, well, maybe we could, well, in the beginning we thought maybe we could raise 50 million. Maybe somebody will be really feel sorry for us and give us some money. But we've been very uh, positively surprised by the reaction we've received from large um, institutions, mainly here in Japan, because we couldn't fly anywhere um, this year. We just launched, we just started fundraising literally this year. Um, but we can't disclose the actual amount, but let's just say we're almost there, is the number. So um, the fundraising, I think, has gone uh, more e easier than we thought, uh, th thank goodness. and. Uh, now we are in full investment mode. So we've closed one deal actually the day that we uh, launched in Unifa, a uh, childcare kind of uh, DX uh, company. Our second company will close next week, we hope, with an announcement. <clears throat> and we've got several um, others in the pipeline. And by the way, we're also investing in overseas startups, not just Japan. Japan will be, unlike Paul's fund, uh, later stage, so middle to later stage growth companies where we think we can add the most value given our combined expertise and experience. But overseas, you know, trying to get into a later stage deal in the US with a $150 million fund, that's really tough and we, we recognize that. So we're looking at earlier stage startups in the, in the, in the US, in Southeast Asia. And since we launched, um, <clears throat> it's been fan fantastic. We're actually overwhelmed by the inbound uh, inquiries that we're getting on very, very interesting companies overseas. So hopefully, you know, we can help those overseas companies, particularly with the angle of getting into the Japanese market, but also conversely helping Japanese startups, as we, I think we all are, uh, trying to help them scale globally. But, but the interesting thing is that in terms of your LPs, <coughs> they're predominantly in Japan? Currently, they're predominantly in Japan. Uh, we have one U.S. family office. Uh, we are in con conversations with several others, but frankly, at this point, I'm, I'm tired of fundraising. <laughs> I want to stop that and focus on the investing. No, no, we're not, we're not tired of fundraising. We, we, we want to fun continue to fundraise forever, but uh, at this point, um, we really have a lot of um, just deals we need to do a lot of diligence on, and that's very time-consuming, so we'd like to focus our attention in that arena. I can add that uh, from uh, when did you guys pull the trigger, I think we barely finished um, our um, New Year's um, lunch, that's when they started launching the fund. And so from launch or from getting to work until actually the first closing was what, about six months, right? Six and a half months. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So it's good. I didn't get any sleep. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I'm delighted um, that I'll um, you know, have, a, have a chance to invite uh, Takano-san. Uh, Takano-san is uh, the example of a renaissance man. Um, you know, he's um, you know, worked in finance for a long time. Takano-san, please tell your story. Okay. Uh, my name is Makoto Takano. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, with uh, my long-term uh, friends, uh, Kiasi and uh, Paul and uh, uh, Jesper. And, and and also, I have to admit that uh, here I have some kind of disadvantage of speaking English because uh, with these three uh, native guys, please bear with my English. But anyway, uh, the first of all, uh, as you see this chart, uh, uh, you know, this is a very busy chart. You don't, you don't have to uh, uh, read through it. But um, uh, let me introduce uh, myself as uh, you know, I've been uh, in uh, uh, almost 27 years uh, uh, in the financial industry. Uh, in that sense, I've been uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, working with Cassie and also uh, uh, and Jesper. And I, in fact, uh, the, my last job was a uh, uh, Tokyo representative of uh, PIMCO Japan. And I've been uh, there for, uh, I've been a, a representative, uh, uh, represent 
the PIMIC Japan uh, in the past 14, year, uh, the 14 years. Then I quit, uh, I, I would say I re uh, retired uh, in 2014, almost eight years ago. And then after that, uh, I switched my uh, uh, theme uh, from a financial expert to uh, give back. So uh, give back means that the, in, uh, I questioned myself that the, you know, what is the most uh, important theme for Japan's economy? As uh, Jesper said, I agree that uh, it's, it has to be more, we need to create a new, uh, new industry. In order for us to create a new industry, we need to more invest well, uh, in entrepreneurs. So uh, I switch my, 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 my gear um, to, uh, to uh, give back means that I want to, I want to contribute to, uh, to, uh, to grow the entrepreneurship in Japan. So, and then, then as you see here, as I have uh, mostly working as, uh, you know, for towards that theme. As you see that, um, you know, the right, right side, managing a fleet. By the way, MT partners means simply that my, uh, my family office, Makoto Takano partners. So it, it's myself, uh, it's identical of uh, just myself. Uh, Managing uh, affiliates includes the Forbes Japan. You may not, you know that the Forbes is one of the, uh, we focus on entrepreneurship and startups. And I, I founded it. It's not, uh, it's not a long term, uh, it, it, it didn't exist before I founded, uh, started uh, 2014. Uh, Forbes, Forbes Japan is now focusing on startups and we've been uh, uh, doing lots of uh, uh, Activity in uh, to to support startups, uh, including uh, uh, startup ranking, um, as you may know. Also, I also started uh, D Hobby. D Hobby is uh, the uh, means design for ventures, which is a uh, which is a uh, uh, joint venture with IDEO. In fact, D Hobby is uh, the only uh, VC. Uh, for idea when we started, uh, we you know in that sense uh, you know the idea you know as, as you know idea is a, um, a design consulting firm which came up with idea of uh, uh, design thinking. So the, the idea wanted uh, to start uh, the the whole in Japan because uh, you know U.S. Uh, uh, if they want to get into a VC business, the uh, U.S. is too competitive. So they believe that Japan has lots of uh, kind of uh, um, uh, growth opportunity. So we started the D4B almost three years ago, and now uh, uh, we successfully, uh, uh, you know, uh, invested in 43 uh, uh, portfolio companies. Now our track record, our track record is uh, pretty good, uh, and uh, we start. We just are now in the process of. Uh, uh, creating a second fund, and um, and also as you see the other fund, you, you may not see that it it, it, it has a uh, GHB. GHB is an Indian uh, the, the um, accelerator fund, accelerator fund along with uh, a WIL, uh, World Innovation Lab, uh, Lab, uh, which is an incubation fund in the, uh, the, the, the India. So uh, first part is like. A, uh, more managing uh, those companies. And also, as you see here, I've been a uh, lots of uh, in angel investment and LP investments. So angel investment, I uh, almost invested in uh, almost 30 uh, companies with uh, uh, with my um, pocket money of like uh, 30 million, which <laughs> is a little bit uh, big though. And uh, the last, last part is uh, NPO and energy support. Uh, you know, I in fact, uh, after my retirement, I started uh, um, contributed to many, many of uh, uh, the NPO, NGO, including uh, Isaac or like Human Rights Watch. But I, in this day, I, I, uh, I retired from those, uh, uh, those, uh, uh, you know, uh, NPO, NGO, which is not uh, directly related to uh, uh, an entrepreneur uh, or startups. So now I'm uh, more devoted to uh, 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 entrepreneur. Uh, incubation type of uh, NPOs, including Endeavor. Endeavor is uh, uh, the largest uh, largest startup um, supporting uh, NPO around the world. I'm a uh, uh, representative uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Matsumoto, Oki, Oki Matsumoto, and Sontaizo. 
And JVCA is a Japan Venture Capital Association I'm managing director, and also I have a recently created a compliance, a compliance team, and I'm head of compliance team, and an API agent, which is a, the, the independent uh, think tank. Uh, so uh, all included, all are uh, kind of, uh, to some extent, uh, related to a startup uh, uh, community. So I would say like uh, this is kind of a this MT pa partner chat is a kind of a my uh, my my own uh, startup ecosystem of a <laughs> startup ecosystem. So that's uh, and now the DHOB is the most uh, important arm um, for me uh, to to devote my time. So DHOB, as you know, is uh, as I said that it's a uh, uh, joint venture with IDEO. Currently, IDEO fifty percent GP and I'm fifty percent GP. Uh, and uh, importantly, the, uh, we, in, we invest in Japan. However, we speak, uh, you know, our um, official language is English. I, every, every day, I speak uh, uh, with my partner in Palo Alto, uh, Tom Kelly, uh, almost every, every morning to talk about uh, the investment, which is very, very uh, unique uh, uh, VC, because Japanese VC is mostly like a domestic, you know, fundraising or domestic, investing in domestic, and speaking domestic language. So in that sense, we try to uh, be a number one, uh, I mean, a competitive, uh, global competitive uh, VC in Japan. So that's my introduction. Uh, again, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking when I said, I mean, Takano-san to me is a Japanese Renaissance man. Um, you know, I mean, you know, you work basically, um, you started out at Daiwa, right? Um, and then you work Goldman's and then PIMCO and made a phenomenally successful career. And then he retires and you didn't mention it here, but the first thing that he did when he retired is he buys Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, I mean how cool is that? <laughs> You know, so I mean, so, wow, I want to be that guy. And then with the Forbes system, right, Takano-san, when you, when you left PIMCO and, and started this sort of eight years ago, right, I mean, was there really sort of an angel investor ecosystem, VC ecosystem in Japan, or was it just beginning? Uh, you know, I don't know. This chat, uh, the, you, you see that uh, there's what I'm doing, but this chat, all of activity uh, I started after I retirement, yeah. okay? And at that time, uh, you know, I was not sure how I can uh, contribute uh, the, my time. And simply, you know, I started the Forbes because uh, the person who started the Forbes failed it. Then I, I took over. And uh, angel investment, I did not, uh, you know, proactively approach to an entrepreneur. They approached me and I said, oh, this is a company that I should support. So it's more like a reactive. So, but uh, then uh, after, the, but once I started, I like to uh, finish with, uh, with, with success. So I did not want to uh, you know, fail uh, in any business. So that's, that's why this, uh, you know, now we ha I have so many uh, functions. But what is interesting, and this is my, my personal bias here, but you know, you remember, um, you know, there was Horimon, right? Uh, Life door uh, with Mr. Koizumi. That was like, wow, it's it's cool to make money, it's cool to be successful, and then that got nailed in, uh, you know, very very quickly, very very aggressively. And I do think that it's fair to say, and Paul, you could back me up here, um, you know, what Takano-san has created with the Forbes ecosystem mm -hmm. is that it's actually cool to be successful again in Japan. It's cool to be young, it's cool to be successful, don't be ashamed, right, uh, of creating a unicorn. And, you know, that's a very, very important contribution that, uh, that I think you've made, right, to the but, overall system. One thing that, that I, I, you know, I think that uh, Forbes Japan has been very successful simply because we do not want to make money. If, if I'm, you know, for example, other media, want to make money because of, uh, that's why they want, to, uh, they want to carry some kind of a gossip, gossips, and also like, uh, you know, sex. We do not do that. Our, our theme of Forbes Japan is uh, the positive journalism, but which cannot make money. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, we created the great branding. So, so the, the final, we made a little bit of money. So message number one, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur in Japan, don't try to make money. <laughs> If, if I can just um, add to the comment or the, the, the point earlier uh, Jesper made about how was this 
ecosystem, you know, eight years ago. And I think, you know, we put together a pitch deck and we had to, you know, to pitch to non-Japanese um, investors. They frankly had no idea <laughs> about the Japanese venture ecosystem. So you have to educate them. And I think Paul had some great stats as well. But what we measured was the market here for venture investing has actually grown sevenfold in seven years. Now that that's extraordinary, but that also tells you how small it was, you know, to begin with. So very small base, extraordinary growth. Um, and I think the other thing is that we measured um, median IRRs or internal rates of return of Japanese VC funds. Uh, bear with me, vintages between 2010 and 2014, the median returns on these funds was between 15 and 30%. To put that in context, that was pretty much in line with US VC funds of similar vintages. And so we looked at this and said, so, you know, we all know, kind of we have a sense that US valuations maybe are up here, China and Europe are kind of here, and Japan is kind of here. Well, what would you do if you're just, you know, white sheet of paper, if you're an asset allocator looking for op opportunities in venture uh, land globally, it looks as if Japan actually can deliver decent returns at a much more reasonable cost, is sort of the pitch, you know, that we used. And the other point I think that was very important is this ecosystem could really never develop without the human capital, right? You could pour all the money you want into, the, into these companies, but if there was not sufficient human capital to scale these companies and to grow them, um, it's not going to amount to much. And what I observed at Goldman was kind of what I think Paul observed at McKinsey was an increasing number of people, and interestingly, not like my generation, the, 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 I call myself grandma generation, but rather the younger uh, Gen Xers or millennials, they were increasingly shifting out of Goldman to go to startups. And I thought that was huge because, you know, Japanese parents at a cocktail party, <laughs> their friends say, oh, oh, Joe-san, nani shite masu ka? Or, oh, oh, no, musuko san And of course, if you could say, ah, oh, proudly, my son or my daughter works for a Jojo Kikyo. You know, it's very, you know, you feel very good. But if it's a, you know, no, nobody's ever heard startup. They're like, ah, yokatta ne, and then they move on in the cocktail reception. <laughs> Sore ga ne, it's, it's finally, I think, beginning to start to change. And I just saw Matsumoto san over there, he's hiding it from Roxel. He's one of the very successful founders of one of the companies on the slide that Paul showed earlier. People look at Matsumoto san and say, oh, I want to be like him. And that's huge to me, to attract the necessary talent, because it's one thing to be a visionary and have this amazing, crazy idea, but if you don't have operations people, if you don't have sales people to really execute your idea into some commercially viable enterprise, then it ain't gonna fly, right? So I think this, this uh, shift of human capital that, that I observed when I was at Goldman um, is a really healthy sign too. Can you add on, elaborate a little bit on, on, on that in terms of, you know, is, is, is that sometimes you hear, oh my God, the talent pool just simply isn't there. You're better off going to Singapore because that's where all these accountants are that you can hire cheaply. Now, I, I, I think that resonates. And as I said uh, in, the, in the intro section, if, if I just take McKinsey as an organization as a little bit of a barometer for, you know, a certain segment of the Japanese workforce, uh, as I said, uh, every year about 150 people leave the organisation uh, and about it is roughly half that, that go into the venture companies and that's been driven by, I think, you know, role models like Matsumoto-san are just like a wonderful case. Uh, in the case of McKinsey, you've got Wealth Navi, for example, Shibayama-san uh, was at McKinsey for a few years before he left. Uh, you've got Neural Pockets, which is an AI startup started by another colleague and, and you've had a series of probably seven or eight fairly high profile exits of McKinsey alum and the impact of that on the broader consulting community and, and the McKinsey community is really significant. So it went from being, you know, it's an odd thing to do, to being, oh wow, you know, the, the, the cool kids are going to the, the venture uh, ecosystem, which is, is great, both from the point of view of, of just, you know, sort of talent pipeline, but also importantly, I think um, that uh, Via their background, they come with a lot of uh, our colleagues come with an international background, 
And so if you look at Neural Pocket, from day one they started with uh, locations in Singapore, Tokyo and another couple of places in Asia. And I think this is one, one challenge or one real opportunity for Japanese startups is starting from the get-go with a global view. Uh, and as Takano-san said before, it, it, you know, what was quite striking for me as I sort of re-engaged with the venture ecosystem is it still is, to be fair, very domestic. I think we've got three sort of exceptions to the rule here. Um, and to be clear, uh, venture capitalists in Japan are absolutely world class. If you look at their performance, to Kathy's point, if you look at the, the returns on the venture funds, they're absolutely in the top quartile globally. Uh, and uh, so it's a little bit like a hidden diamond. And as you talk to LPs in the US and Europe, uh, they're, they're just stunned by the, just by the, the numbers and, and the performance. So I, I think there's a real opportunity in terms of both getting LPs to come to Japan more, uh, but also for Japanese startups to start with a little bit more of a global footprint and work from there. You know, you've, you've been involved in, in angel investing now with D4V, um, you know, sort of in a more institutional framework. Uh, talk a little bit about the pipeline. You know, it's like every day your phone rings and there is uh, 15 new companies that, uh, you know, want to, to be invested in with you. Talk, talk, talk a little bit about the sourcing of deals and how, how that works in Japan. That's a good uh, question. Um, you know, I've been in the asset management industry in the past uh, more than 25 years, right? And the VC is part of an asset management company, right, industry, but it's totally different, totally different. There's, there are kind of segregation, right? In order for us to be successful uh, uh, VC, in order for us to get uh, successfully access to a uh, uh, new company to invest, we need to be in the, uh, in the, uh, in the inner circle. It's kind of a mura, mura shakai, right? You know, it's uh, in asset management industry, we are competitive with each other. Yeah. In, in the VC, uh, VC was like us, we are friendly each other. It's so different. So first of all, uh, we need to have a, be a in, a, in a circle. But the, the, to be in a circle also prevent us to be a, a open society, yeah. right? So, so VC was, not only VC was, but some of, uh, most of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the uh, Yaskana is a little different, but uh, most of our entrepreneurs are domestic and domestic oriented. So we need to, in order for us to be, again, that, uh, uh, to successful, uh, successfully access to, that we need to be in inner circle. And however, it may change because, uh, you know, as you know, as, as Kashi said that, uh, you know, uh, VC is growing, growing, uh, and some of the, some of the venture investment is growing in the, in the past five years. Some of uh, you may say that this is a kind of boom, third boom, right? Third boom of venture investment. But I would say this is not boom. This is a trend. Uh, when I joined the uh, Goldman uh, along with uh, uh, Cassie, uh, I joined uh, 1997, right? Um, almost 24 years ago. 24 years ago. And uh, Goldman Sachs, I was uh, uh, in the asset management uh, division. It called g -Sum, right? g -Sum, uh, at that time uh, was successful already uh, for retail, but not uh, institutional investment. So I started the pension business. I started the pension business in the Goldman Sachs asset management in Japan. At that time, it was very immature industry. You know, people are getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting business by golfing and drinking uh, with clients. That's the good old days. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and the quality of people there was not great. I see the same things here in, uh, in the VC world. It's immature, yeah. right? Not, I, you know, some of a person like uh, the, the poor is very, very great, but it's, it's kind of uh, unusual. Mm -hmm. So but I, again, I think this is a trend. It should uh, uh, improve, improve, improve in the next probably 30 or 40 years. Something for all of you. So um, two years ago, I had the opportunity to be with Masayoshi Son. And I said, look, um, you know, this is awesome. You've got the Vision Fund, the world's largest venture capital pool. And you're just like investing gung-ho, gung-ho, gung-ho. Um, you don't have a single investment in Japan. Why is it that the Japan-managed Vision Fund the world's largest venture capital fund, doesn't have a single significant position in Japan. And he goes, ah, Kuro-san, Kuro-san, 
I try. Once every two years, I go, I open, I have a pitch from the Japanese. After 90 seconds, I walk out of the room because they have no ambition. They want to be the king of Shibuya. They don't want to conquer the world. I'm only interested in companies that want to conquer the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? You mentioned that the VC community, the angel investment community, it's a murashakai, which is fine. Probably, honestly speaking, a lot of people in Silicon Valley would agree that there is an element of that as well. But in terms of the ambition of the entrepreneurs, right? Um, you know, this is, you know, they, they work for Japan, the Japan model of some imported technology or some imported business model that works very well, but, you know, it's only for Shimaguni, it's only for Japan, the ambitions are not global. Any comments on that? Well, I, I'm a newbie <laughs> at this game, but uh, have met quite a number of Japanese entrepreneurs, and I think I can safely say most of them are very uh, domestic uh, in their thinking, in their scale. And when you ask them, you know, you've got an amazing technology or whatever, have you thought about entering whatever market? And they said, yes, but, you know, we think we have enough demand here. And, and for many companies, that is very valid. That's a very valid argument. But, you know, just going back to what you were saying earlier about the, um, the sourcing and uh, kind of the type of people uh, in this world. Again, I'm, I'm just coming at this from a very, you know, naive and, and, and not knowing much perspective. But I do feel that, it, you know, I know that venture investing globally lacks diversity, and I don't mean just gender, but Japan's venture world really lacks diversity. I, I mean cognitive diversity. And so I think there's a real opportunity if you can coach and support these entrepreneurs to think bigger and think more scale and give them, you know, connect them with people in overseas markets that are doing something similar that they could partner with, I think the sky is the limit. Um, that's my first point. Uh, my second point is that, you know, one of the issues, I think, as to why Japan's venture industry has actually been as small as it is, is because as, as many of us know, we've observed this phenomenon where there are a lot of providers of early stage venture capital in Japan, relatively speaking. But as I said, in the last seven years, this market has really um, expanded exponentially. Yet the providers of capital at that later stage of growth is actually less than at the earlier stage. So you don't have trouble raising money early but when you get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's uh, not a dearth, but uh, a lack of the same amount of capital, then it's super tempting, if you want to you know, raise more money uh, or get bigger, is to go public, and usually on mothers. And the problem is we've observed that there are many companies who are so tempted by that option that they go uh, do an IPO prematurely. So, kotsubu de owatte shimau. And we think that if we, this is one reason why we're targeting a bit later stage, is because we want to help them, you know, kind of mature their businesses, get more market traction, develop more customers, be a real company before they go IPO, and of course help them on the ESG fronts as well, so that they're not kotsubu de owatte shimau janaku they can really you know, scale up. That will be the next stage of their growth phase you know, once they IPO. So in any way, uh, in any sense, what I'm trying to say is I think there's a lot of opportunity because of the immaturity of the market, because of the lack of diversity of thought, that there is, you know, the ingredients are there, but they just need a little bit of extra help, be it capital provision or, you know, networks, um, giving them, you know, support on HR, on organizational things. And very interestingly, I don't know how many companies we've spoken to in Japan, but almost without exception, they've all asked, can you help us with board diversity? Because now Goldman Sachs Asset Management, State Street Global, proxy advisors like Glass Lewis, guess what? They're requiring at least one diverse board member for Japanese listed companies. 
So there are a lot of startups that are at that late stage, and they're looking at IPO in two, three, four years' time, and they have all males on their boards. Uh-oh, <laughs> you know? And so, anyway, this is a plea for all of you. If you know women, <laughs> or, or, or LGBTQ, <laughs> or foreigners, who are interested in serving on startup company boards, I think all of us would love that, <laughs> that, that those, uh, those candidates because there's a massive demand. I know there's a massive demand at public big companies, but there's also massive demand in the startup space. Um, and you know, as the only, I think, female-led uh, uh, VC firm in Japan, we want to help with this, but we can't do it ourselves. So we hope that others will jump on this bandwagon. Paul, sort of any, 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 any sort of comment in terms of uh, you know, sort of the, the, the developments? Yeah, two thoughts. One is, um, if you look at the more recent numbers of seed stage investments, there's been a little bit of a shift to deep tech. And by nature, there's uh, more pliable avenues to global with deep tech. To give a concrete example, Japan's the global leader. Uh, it's not a fun fact, really, but uh, <laughs> stomach camera. Okay. You come it up. Uh, Japan's the global leader in this space. Don't ask me why, but you know, the number of, uh, you know, imaging you know takes per head of population is is easily the top in the world and so you have the richest data set for stomach cancer analytics in japan and also uh, uh colon short colon long colon um and we have a portfolio company that's in that space and the medical space is very global already even you know what you consider to be a fairly domestic sort of academic will already have global networks and connections so one observation is you get further into deep tech as opposed to software as a service. The service bit has a natural implication that you're dealing with a certain customer set. And so you do find that SARS can become a little bit sort of country specific depending on how it's architected. Uh, deep tech, we find that there are more avenues for, for global expansion. So um, if you look at this particular investment that we've made, they're doing roadshows regularly in Europe and the US. Uh, facilitated by uh, Nomba and the team there. So I think as you see a little bit of shift in the investment types, you'll see that avenue open up. Uh, I think the second point is the, the talent point. Um, the inflow of, of more bilingual sort of global talent I think is an important one. Uh, and for me personally, you know, with this sort of background, being in Japan for 30 years, but having a sort of a more international background and networks, uh, I, a, a really important part of my decision to join the sort of venture space was to, to coach and enable those those connections. Um, one thing that's just been fascinating for me, as I said before, is doing even doing fundraising. LPs are like, you know, where were you, people? Like, you know, how on earth did you have this level of performance? And and why the hell were you not in our faces, like, you know, daily talking about your performance and beating your chest and, and soliciting investments? So I think the same could be said for a lot of venture companies in Japan, that just by virtue of soliciting global investments and getting support. So if you look at the way, for example, Will's set up with their sort of, they have sort of a, a US branch and a Japan branch and they support US companies entering Japan. The reverse can be said of a lot of VCs in the US and Europe. So as you get more Euro Europeans and US VCs investing in Japan, they'll also provide support for Japanese companies to go global. So I'm sort of, I, I agree that the level of diversity is really low. I think there are paths through deep tech and through more international investment to get there. Yeah. Takano-san, your venture, D4V, uh, is, is actually very, very interesting because um, you know, it's a, a, a joint venture with IDEO, the design thinking and design company. Um, you know, Takano-san, can, can you tell us a little bit about some of your portfolio companies and really you know, the, the, the thinking behind you know, you know, fine, you've got the engineer, you've got the charismatic entrepreneur who wants to get something going, but to actually make it visually appealing, to make it, you know, uh, sexy marketing, um, you know, how, how, does, how does that, you know, that, that's your vision, right? Yeah. Uh, the, one of the uh, important uh, uh, characteristic of the hobby is design thinking, you know, uh, as you know, that uh, design thinking is a very famous theme uh, in uh, uh, venture world in Silicon Valley, but not in Japan, right? In Silicon Valley, if uh, you know entrepreneur want to start a company with like uh, four four uh, colleagues, and among five of, of them, at least one person is a design uh, uh, expert. Mm -hmm. But in Japan, you know. I don't think I don't see any 
I, I don't see, I don't think it's so many uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, in startups has that design. Design. So that is my, uh, unique. In fact, uh, the, I, I'm not sure how, how much you know the idea, but idea is a well-known consultant uh, design thinking consultant firm. If you want to hire them, it's very expensive. <laughs> Maybe, right? I, but uh, once we invest, IDEO can provide uh, the design support for free. Because it's kind of part of agreement, that stuff. So, which is very powerful tool, right? That's why uh, we, you know, we've been, uh, you know, uh, we invest in 43 uh, portfolio company in the fund, uh, uh, first fund. Out of 43, probably we, we provide uh, at least uh, 20 companies, uh, our design support for free. Like, uh, you know, developing a UI UX, developing logo, developing brand, uh, brand, uh, brand uh, the uh, strategy, and also uh, uh, helping them to, uh, to hire designers. So that's really powerful. That's why the, our, and also second uh, uniqueness is we, uh, kind, we uh, invest in domestic pieces, uh, poultry companies, but we are a global company, right? We speak in English. That's it's, it's kind of a, so that's why the, in terms of uh, um, uh, sourcing, uh, the entrepreneurs who want to go global tend to come to us rather than come to the other pieces. So that, that's why sometimes, uh, you know, in our investment committee, uh, when we uh, uh, in, uh, invite a uh, entrepreneur to make a presentation, I would say like one third of, uh, of the presentation is made by English. Right. So that's kind of very unique. Uh, fantastic. I um, want to open up the floor uh, to the floor for any uh, sort of questions that you may have. Admiral. Thank you very much. Otsuka Omiya, I'm ambassador of Japan to the Republic of Djibouti, and now temporarily back to Tokyo. Uh, I was in the Navy for 40 years, and uh, I have felt, I'm not in the position to criticize my government, but still, I have tremendously felt that Japan has been losing the mentality of adventurous. Uh, this is uh, the world that I would go out. But now uh, people have become more and more risk averse and irresponsible. They don't want to take response, responsibilities. And as a result, you know, the, the society itself has shrunk. And I was in the private sector for Seoul Shosha for six months. And even in the private sector, I felt that. So, but I. I'm a little bit uh, optimistic having heard what you all mentioned, that the venture capital is growing. That means, as Jasper said, the mentality of this uh, uh, ambition should grow up. But, but still, I'm very much skeptical about the course of the nation that is not taking the risk. Vice, you know, taking more risk averse with too much compliances, too much accountabilities. I, I think your observation is correct r related to, you know, I, I think it's safe to say we're all s similar generation um, people. Um, but what my earlier comment was referring to is what I'm observed and perhaps what Paul's observed at McKinsey is that, you know, younger generation, meaning maybe yes, Bernard kids <laughs> or, or slightly above in their 20s and their early 30s not mar yet married, you know, don't have a lot of baggage, therefore don't have a lot of risks. And I think you know, it's safe to say that the economy after 20 plus years of stagnation and deflation did hit a bit of an inflection point, right? And enabled, I think, individuals to say, hey, should I wait Sun Junen, you know, 30 years to become Bucho? Or <laughs> is there an alternate path in life? And as you all know, the labor market is uh, uber tight here. It's a seller's market for talent. So if you're ambitious and you know you're smart, you know you can either stay at the status quo job that you have, or you try something new. And um, I was actually quite shocked. A young woman I mentored for many years at Goldman. She was in fixed income, and one day she says, "I'm leaving." <laughs> I was like, "What? What are you leaving for?" And I thought it was for personal family reasons. And I'm going to become, you know, CFO um, at a startup. Later then, I heard that C that startup was Mercari. <laughs> wow. And I had no idea she had these ambitions. Um, she was actually a young mother. I, I think she's, she had a child. So she didn't fit that usual profile, but she wanted to take that leap. 
Um, and I know that you know, in most cases, they take a big cut in pay, right? Um, it's a very uncertain future, but I think that that tide has just begun to turn. I'm not saying it's for every young person in Japan, um, and there's still too, too few Japanese who go study abroad, we all know that. But I just think we're at a little um, a more interesting tipping point just in the last uh, few years, from my personal observation. Yeah, I, I think, um, having been in Japan for 30 years, I've sort of seen an evolution. One of my deepest frustrations has been the lack of uh, you know, students going overseas or the, the decline over time. If you look at the number of MBA students in the top schools, it's, it's declined by, I think, about a factor of five. Well, it's quite a stunning number. And so Japan's a little bit like that at times where you, you see certain data points that point you in one direction. At the same time, uh, just as I've entered this space, the day that I made my announcement within, uh, my, within McKinsey that I was, I was leaving and joining uh, Incubate Fund, I probably got about 100 emails from colleagues around the world just, just saying, let's talk. And I'm in discussion with probably uh, five or seven, five, five or six uh, uh, colleagues who have already left McKinsey who want to start companies and, and would like me to, to, to support them. And that was very encouraging, that sort of... And, and I think what we're seeing is I think there's still a gap to close around the global piece, but I think in terms of risk-taking of, of what we'd call risk-taking at a younger generation, they don't see it as risk at all. So I'm, I'm talking about hiring associates, for example, right now, and, and they're in some of the top sort of professional firms. And, and the pay cut's dramatic. And, and, and so I'll be interviewing, super excited about, you know, the, the colleague. Uh, and, and I'll be sitting there going, OK, I'm going to have to talk about pay at some point. And, and towards the end of the conversation, I'll just sort of slip in that, you know, I, I think you're going to have about a 2x, you know, like a 50 to 70% reduction in pay. Is that OK? And I'll be very hesitant. And they won't even blink. They'll be like, yep, OK, that sounds good. You know, I'm going to get... So uh, just it's sort of little data points. A couple other data points for you. This afternoon, I'm meeting with uh, an entrepreneur who's 23, who's been running businesses since he was 15. Um, and, and it was a funny conversation because you have these sort of, you know, uh, unconscious biases. And, and I was talking with, uh, uh, with his founder and uh, we were talking about background. And, uh, you know, I, I think we were talking about um, universities. And he said, oh, no, um, no university experience. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. He said, yeah, no, I, after uh, junior high school, I, I started my first company. <laughs> I was going, oh, okay. So you have eight years' experience running companies. That's impressive at 23 years of age. And his idea is awesome. It's like this sort of B2B platform. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about it. But it's just cases like that that really give me a lot of sort of encouragement. And I think the mental model is that the math around uh, monetary sort of flow right now versus experience, work-life balance, high aspirations, excitement, the, the, ma the, the equation's completely flipped right now, especially among what we might traditionally consider to be more elite profiles, you know, the, the good schools going to the, the good companies. So uh, I, I'm encouraged by that. I'm still frustrated that we aren't seeing an uptick in, in global study. I'm, I'm quite passionate about that, taking gap years, spending time overseas. But uh, in the micro, I'm, I'm very encouraged. One point to that is I think that there's also now a generation of people who've made some money. I mean, there's lots of IPOs, so you made some money. And these entrepreneurs, they want to give back. They want to mentor, right? They want to build their group. And so this is this inflection point that I think that we were at during the 1990s. Oh, my God, everything was terrible. Um, you know, now you actually do have the first generation of millionaires, right, self-made millionaires, and they, they give back. And if at the same time, to Takano-san's point, right? I think the ability to celebrate success, no, you're not going to Toshiba, you're gonna to celebrate success by actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, starting a venture capital, uh, uh, sorry, a venture firm, that ecosystem I think is coming through. Now, other questions. Um, Kimura-san. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, thank you, Kathy, uh, Takano-san, and Paul uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Shigeki Kimura. And uh, my background used to be uh, in the government sector, Ministry of Finance, but, and I also worked for the uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, but I'm now uh, advising uh, one of the 
maybe some, some kind of a venture capital, uh, which is uh, established by the Japan Post Bank. Uh, Japan Post Investment Corporation, and uh, it's one of the uh, investment strategy is to invest in uh, later stage venture <laughs> companies. So now Kathy came in and a big rival. Uh, we, we want to be friends, <laughs> not the enemies, but <laughs> okay. And my question may be related to, 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 to what I am doing right now because of that advisor portion, I have been thinking about uh, what kind of opportunities would be there for Japanese startups and uh, particularly because of the unique Japanese pain points. And also, I have been involved in the government sector, blah, blah, blah. So combining those two things, I, uh, what I am thinking, asking myself is uh, uh, related to a so-called government tech or a leg tech. Uh, so the reason why I see a lot of opportunity there is, so what we observed in the COVID-19 situation is how poorly functions this government works. So I didn't expect that. But uh, taking uh, vaccination as an example, uh, my number is not used, or well, cannot be used for the registration of the vaccination. And uh, it takes uh, uh, three months to, to, to pay out the subsidy of the government for the individuals and the uh, uh, entrepreneurs or companies. So, Pain, there are lots of pain points, uh, a lack of interface between the local government and the central government, but pain points means opportunities. So I would appreciate if you could, any of you could share your views on how you see these kind of opportunities for Japanese startups. Thank you. So red tech opportunities in Japan. <laughs> This has nothing to do with reg tech, but I just have to laugh because <laughs> starting a company in Japan, I did not understand how complex it was. Uh, I am now the proud owner of a hanko for the first time in over 30 years of living in Japan to establish a kabushiki aisha. To open simply, I hope there's nobody from a Japanese bank in the room, a Japanese corporate bank account took a long time many hours, and we actually ended up switching the bank because we were so frustrated with the service we received to just like you said, a lot of um, things that need to be filed and registered and uh, everything is still very analog. So it's not just GovTech, I think it's overall, you know, the need for, as we all know, you know, digital transformation in, in so many aspects of, of Japan. That means a host of opportunities, um, in my opinion. And I think there's some very interesting companies now coming up the, the pipeline um, in some of those areas. But absolutely, um, the, the, the tons of low-hanging fruit in that space. Um, so we have one uh, question from uh, Christian Schmidt. And um, he's asking, well, he's, ask, he's asking, uh, can we help with funding as well? But um, before we go to that, uh, here's one question sure. from him. Um, in Japan, valuations are low and entrepreneur skill sets are available. Therefore, investing into Japanese startups could be a great deal uh, when we can scale them internationally. What can we do to bring Japanese startup entrepreneurs towards real problem solving and tackling the gr grand challenges of humanity? And how can we uh, make this a profitable game for investors as well? It's a big question. It's a big question. So Christian, my, my email address is paul at <laughs> incubatefund.com. Oh, you got that? Okay. Um, Christian, oh, thank you. Um, it, it, it is a very big question. I think, I think to Kathy's point, there is a, a coaching element where uh, just by virtue of asking good questions of an entrepreneur as they come with an idea, uh, I think oftentimes they'll just be limiting through their own experience and direct observations, they'll be limiting themselves much more than they need to. So again, a concrete example, last, uh, an investment that I'll probably be making next month, there was a, an entrepreneur talking about a certain business in Japan and uh, my best guess was it would probably be a business worth maybe two or three hundred million in, in five years and, and, and a healthy growing business, very profitable. Um, and my question to him was, I just said, okay, would you be happy with that picture? And I painted the picture of what it might look like. And I said, or oh, would you be happier with, with a business that has, you know, vibrant businesses in multiple countries, perhaps using what you've built in Japan in these ways? And I tried to paint the picture a bit. 
And, and his feedback to me, because I wasn't sure if I'd invest or not, because at, at the scale he was talking about, it didn't feel like the right scale. Um, and he was super excited. Like, he was like, you know, you're the first... Every other VC I've spoken to has sort of said, that's, that's a good business, here's here, you could tweak it on the margin, I can find you a CTO, he, you know. Um, and so I, I think just the simple, like putting a little bit of effort into thinking about what could be and then coaching entrepreneurs in Japan I think will go a long way towards that. Uh, and I think in the same vein, coaching them around how to think about pain points. I think you make an excellent point around GovTech. Is it's, a, it's such a massive space, but it's, it's a real challenge. We have a, a portfolio company called Grapha that is one of the leading companies in this space. And they literally had to start with just a website that had information on how to navigate administration you know, in local governments. And th they started with literally a website, HTML, because that was all they could do. And then over time, they figured out how to deal with the multi-year bidding process, how to figure out um, recurring revenues are only recurring revenues if you can contract for more than a year. But Japanese governments, everything has to go out to bid every year. And so by virtue, for, for an investor, you're going like, okay, hang on, you, you don't have annual recurring revenue. You've got like single year revenue. And so there's a lot of challenges, but they've worked it through and now it's a very exciting business. So I think orienting entrepreneurs around the, the big problems to tackle and how to be patient with capital. Because the great news in Japan now is that, you know, with, with funds like Kathy's Fund, you, you can be super patient in the way you tackle a problem because you're going to be able to rely on quality growth equity over a longer time frame to really solve the problem. So I think there's a lot of it that, that is around coaching. What do you believe U.S. entrepreneurs can learn from Japanese entrepreneurs and vice versa? So what uh, U.S. entrepreneur can learn from Japanese entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. I think... Patience. Uh, yeah, patience. That's, that's patience. <laughs> and also, uh, I think... Uh, hmm. I know that there are so many uh, things that the Japanese entrepreneurs to run, the U.S. entrepreneurs, but cannot come up with uh, the vice versa. Do you have anything? Well, I, I, just off the top of my head, I, I would imagine that you know U.S. entrepreneurs, they're rather spoiled by almost everything they touch, <laughs> you know, kind of goes up. And here, as we all know from de deflation and stagnation, it's really tough to start any business and get market traction. And so I think those perhaps skills or lessons learned from working and operating in a really, really tough environment, um, probably, I don't know what exactly those skills are, but you know, patience and, and learning how to refine your strategy to ensure that you're getting you know, customers that you need, um, to fixing the UI and the UX experience so that it's really fitting what the customers want. I think all of this, um, not that every Japanese entrepreneur, of course, has it perfectly, but I think they've had a lot more, maybe, experience in that regard. Yeah. I, I think I had a okay. similar one. Uh, you know, in the, in, in the US, that there's uh, some culture of fear. It's, it, it, it's kind of welcomed, right? It's, in Japan, it's not. That means, as you said, it's, uh, the entrepreneur has to uh, survive with any of uh, uh, effort. That's probably related to that, as you said, that the patient. But it's really, uh, you know, they have to patient, 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 uh, particularly in this COVID-19. It's, you know, they cannot easily uh, give up. Uh, probably that is one that, that they have, you know, it's different uh, between Japan and US. One very quick one, which is, um, the, the math is that, you know, 3% of the US workforce is, is tech, you know, related talent. 1% of the Japanese workforce is. And so the, the tech talent challenge in Japan is massive. But I, I take that as a positive in a way that the Japanese entrepreneurs are very good at getting a lot out, out of their tech talent and leveraging. And I think, as you see, for, if you look at just data and analytics over the last 10 years, it used to be a ratio of about five data scientists to one data engineer when, you know, back 10 years ago. Now, with AI and, uh, and, and advancement in technology, you can get away with one data scientist, but you need more data engineers, so the data cleaning on the front end. So I'd say that leverage of, of talent in a more creative way, because I think the US is spoiled for talent in that sense. So I think there's something to be like that. The US is spoiled for talent, and it's too easy to fail. Um, I think Robert, Robert had a question. Good. To, to follow up on my friend Umio's question, and 
I, I think you pointed out that at places like Gorman and McKinsey, you have young, ambitious people. But you know, sadly, they're not necessarily representative of Japanese business to start with their foreign companies. What always strikes me is I deal with a lot of young Japanese in their 20s, early 30s who work for large institutions, mostly the government. And what is noticeable if you compare them to their European or American peers is that they're not empowered until they reach the age at which you have grandchildren. And I think that's an issue here because it means that if you work for a large organization, a lot of people do, you're not really being trained to be an entrepreneur. I mean, there are lots of young European American officials. Maybe I would hire them if I started a business. Said, okay, you, know, you work for government, but you have Japanese ones. It's surely not that not hardworking. It's not that not intelligent, but they've been trained in an organization where they're still back carriers in their mid-30s, even though they have m many more cap capabilities. And I think that's a real obstacle here. I think it's to point out leadership experience in Japanese corporations is for a subset, certainly a, a challenge. One observation that I would make is, and obviously Kathy and I come from, you know, Goldman and McKinsey, so we tend to focus our comments on, on those, but I've always been really surprised by, uh, especially, like, I think about 20% of the people we hire at McKinsey have come from the government, and they make the gear change in about three to six months. So with the right sort of coaching and sort of leadership, I think the potential's still there, and the aspiration, so although they're not given the responsibilities, the way that they think about the sort of job and the aspirations they set within that uh, tend to be pretty high. So I've been encouraged just by the ability to make the gear change and I think the important switch is, is as it becomes cool to sort of be at venture companies that they'll get you know the, the, the groundwork and the leadership training in a very short time frame in a venture context just because of the met metabolic rate. But I agree with in, in traditional large institutions, it, it's a real challenge. You, you know, the level of responsibility given, even at a higher age, is pretty low. Robert, just to, for 30 seconds to comment on that, you find that uh, more and more of the larger corporations, right, are actually, um, you know, starting to implement uh, sort of 15% or 20% rules mm -hmm. where individual teams can actually take 15% of their time uh, to come up with a business plan and then once a quarter they've got these beauty contests, um, you know, and if they're successful they actually get funding to devote more of their time. So intrapreneurship, right, in particular the large industrial companies, is something that you don't want to underestimate here, right? Uh, we've got one question from the young generation in the room. Hi, my name's Yuko. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so I work in a foundation that promotes impact investing, and we also do startup philanthropy advisor recently. Um, I guess this question is for you, Kathy. But um, so, um, how do you support uh, your investees with uh, E and especially S? So, first of all, in terms of the um, how we integrate ESG in the investment process, we don't necessarily screen out uh, companies if they don't fall directly in the domains of you know, environment-related, social-related, or governance um, areas. Uh, of course, it could be a climate tech company. It could be, you know, like we invest in this childcare, you know, um, digital transformation company. But even if it has nothing to do with the E and the S and the G, we'll look at the company. If it's got a promising you know, business profile and, and, and very exciting growth potential, we will look at it. But how we integrate ESG into our process is we first um, have multiple interviews with the leadership team to ask them what do they believe is most material of the E, the S, and the G. And a lot of the companies are tech companies, and they say, we don't spew you know, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, we don't have to care about the E. But oh, no, no. <laughs> you have to care about your E, even if you're a tech company, right? You also have to care about the S, because about issues related to data privacy, right? So we go through, and we've, um, there's no, unfortunately, any one global standard. As you know, for ESG, frankly, for large companies, much less for private companies, but we've gathered as many um, examples of best practice frameworks globally, and we're customizing them for startups. And for the Japanese startups so far that we've engaged with, we work with them 
to come up with a roadmap on ESG, but we're not dictating to the startup, you must do this, you must do that. They have to come up with a plan and we will help them implement that plan with resources or with you know some training or what, what, whatever. Um, and so that's kind of the way that we engage and we partner uh, with the companies. But at the end of the day, you know, some people say to us, but aren't you squashing the very spirit of an entrepreneur, right? And how do you strike that balance? Because on the one hand, you can't squash or quell their passion for whatever they're doing uh, with, you know, these, oh, you've got to do E, S, S and G, you know, it's, it's kind of like Mendel Xai and, and Hassel. No, but we also want them to believe, we, we will only work with entrepreneurs who believe that that very inter integration of ESG principles will actually help drive better growth. If it's not core to their business strategy, we don't want to help them because we know they're just ticking off boxes and it's meaningless at the end of the day. So I would say our, our approach is not fitting every startup in Japan. I can tell you right now, we've had a lot of conversations with companies. I don't know why, but they just want to meet us. And then after about 30 minutes, it's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, they just kind of want the Empower Partner stamp of ESG. Nanka, you know, <laughs> you know, nanka certification. And we know they don't really mean in their, in their spirit that they really want to change. And so kind of dividing those, those entrepreneurs is our task, but it's not a, a, a sprint, it's a marathon when it comes to you know, diversity. We're not just talking about board diversity, we're talking about their own internal hiring practices, their promotion practices. We're talking about their social um, things like um, help, the well-being of their employees. How do they measure that? How do they track that? Do they have policies in place for whistleblower? I don't know about Takano-san and Paul, but we have encountered a lot of issues around power harass harassment, sometimes unfortunately sexual harassment, and these are not obvious things that come out in the first one hour meeting, right? And so digging deep and trying to figure out, you know, what are some potential risks that we might not be aware of in their pitch deck, right, that are hidden uh, is very, very important for us to, to suss out. But did you want to? Just, just one quick additional observation. It was quite striking for me. Uh, I. At McKinsey, I served uh, consumer clients, so consumer and retail. And really, I think consumer and retail clients in Japan in particular are just starting to understand that this is an important thing they need to understand in that very early phase. What's quite striking is as I came to Incubate Fund and we we're talking with global LPs, so we've got one LP who's committed to our next fund, uh, and they literally, uh, we did a whole ton of due diligence, but the ESG questionnaire was 12 pages long. Uh, and, and that's a short version. That's the short version. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to need Kathy's help <laughs> because because it was and and so that was a real wake up. It was it was great because it was a real wake up call for the leadership. Going, oh, okay, so this is a thing. Like you know, th this is really a, an important aspect. And and as you deepen your understanding, I think you come to the understanding initially. Initially, you feel like okay, checkbox. When you've got 12 pages and they start really digging deep, you start to understand how it then translates into better investing and, and more higher quality growth. So I think that's going to be a process. But I think it is important to understand that if you make it integral, there's, there's a lot you can do to create like world-class companies off the back of that. Am I going to advertise you? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for interesting uh, conversations. And uh, from the point of uh, um, domestic Roppongimura, um, uh, I started a uh, company in 2009 and uh, uh, running a company for 12 years and uh, uh, I would like to uh, give one uh, change. Uh, I uh, provide uh, um, one thing uh, what happened in um, the small Japanese um, startup economy so about uh, globalization. So uh, globalization, uh, I, I think that uh, globalization has uh, three meanings. One is uh, um, market globalization. Uh, we are uh, operating the business in Japan, States, or China. And one is our organization, uh, how global the uh, team or uh, hub, or uh, also the capitalization, the how, how much, um, how many are, are global investors invest your company. So, 
looking back at uh, um, Japanese ecosystem, um, the capitalization, about capitalization, uh, the globalization is very um, speedy, uh, accelerate um, very much. Uh, in here, um, many of guys are capitalist, <laughs> not entrepreneur. <laughs> so um, yeah, so thanks for Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman Sachs provide, provides a lot of CFO to startups. And we can uh, fundraise uh, from um, uh, global investor. Uh, yeah. So uh, the from the point of um, CFO, the our Japanese startup is already uh, enough global, but their uh, um, CFO or capitalization uh, is not uh, globalization itself. It's uh, mainly in Japan, there's a two startup who make a great success in the United States. One is a Melkali, one is a Smart News. Uh, I remember that uh, they are uh, set their uh, um, United States branch in 2014. Uh, they uh, set it, uh, their company in 2012. And two years later, they, they set a company. And what's amazing uh, of Melkali or Smart News is uh, their organization are, is a very global, and uh, uh, our main language is uh, English, and uh, are also CTO uh, Chinese in uh, uh, Smart News. And uh, uh, Mercari hired John uh, in States, and also Smart News are hired a uh, very high level of Amazon um, management. And they are make a uh, global organization in Silicon Valley. Um, and their uh, Mercari have their three hundred million dollars over uh, monthly transaction. They got to be number two, uh, free, um, the secondary uh, up uh, trading apps are in states, and Smart News became uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, news uh, apps in states. So um, what uh, I right now, Roxy is setting up for. Um, our uh, de development center in Bangalore and uh, try to change company more global uh, in terms of organization. But uh, what happens is very difficult to change uh, because uh, uh, we have our 400 employees, uh, they are very domestic. Uh, I have a strong will, but uh, uh, people, uh, it's quite difficult to change. So. CFO is a uh, very easy uh, to change because uh, th this is just one person. But their uh, organization is a whole team, and uh, um, to make the global team, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is uh, very difficult to uh, transform. After um, the business success in Japan, uh, they are. Uh, if uh, I back to uh, ten years ago. Uh, I will make uh, the organization itself as a global uh, and uh, hire non-Japanese. So the question uh, is uh, how uh, you guys support a uh, Japanese startup uh, to build up a uh, global organization? So um, just a quick thought. Um, and th thank you for the, those observations, Matsumoto-san. I, I, I'm starting, I'm, I'm working with a number of our portfolio companies on this very topic right now. And I'll give you just one specific example. There's, there's a, a portfolio company we have now which um, provides, it's a training platform, a video training platform. And it's, it's a very good product. Loads of potential for Asian countries, especially ASEAN, where they're trying to bring up the sort of service level of the, the sectors. And as I've been working with the management team, and I think the trick is, if you try to flip a whole organization into English, like overnight, it's very difficult. But if you look for two or three bilingual high-level executives who can lead the hiring and the creation of the organization in another country, it's a much smaller problem to solve. And so I think the trick is that you start with, just as Smart News did, for example, or, uh, or Mercari did with, with that, those key hires, I think if you start at the top, and you find just the one or two individuals who can help you to develop the international business and then allow them to build the business. And over time, you'll have more interaction between the organisations. But I think starting there is, is the real trick. And that's what I've been working on, finding candidates for those companies. And my, my sense is that's one of the unlocks. And I think the other one, to your point, is starting early. So one of my portfolio companies uh, literally 
I made the investment three months ago. They're already looking at uh, opportunities in Africa for e-commerce growth support. So I think starting early too is, is super important. But I think just the key management is a great place to start. In terms of uh, uh, support uh, uh, to uh, global support to entrepreneurs, I think there's three uh, elements. One is product, second, distribution, third, capital. I mean, uh, fundraising. First one, uh, as we are a global organization, I mean, uh, uh, we have a, uh, as I said, uh, we have a, a partnership with the IDEO. So IDEO around the world, uh, we have a six, more than 600 uh, uh, designers. And uh, you know, sometimes we may uh, uh, ask their help to brush up the product. Second, the distribution is really diff difficult, but uh, sometimes we, uh, for example, we uh, um, you know, uh, went to uh, India with, uh, uh, with one startup to, uh, as they want to they wanna expand their business into uh, India. So we, uh, we've been uh, uh, using our network to, uh, to introduce them, that's likewise. We may do that, we can do that if uh, Antrina wants us to uh, introduce, uh, but just the introduction. So, and uh, finally, they have to do that by themselves, but we just help them. So the other one is like, a, uh, you know, fundraising. Fundraising is the most difficult part, but uh, as, uh, as our, you know, um, team member and also uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, advisors, including uh, Yespa, and also uh, the Idei-san, and the Mashioka, you know, that uh, we can, we, we have some of uh, the ideas to uh, who they should uh, approach and we can introduce them. I think, you know, if you get some more LP participation, right, into the venture capital firm that sponsors you using that LP network, I think it's something that we're looking to our friends who are online from Silicon Valley, um, you know, because I think um, we've reached, unfortunately, the end of the time uh, here. Um, uh, message number one, um, Japanese startups, entrepreneurs, um, diamonds in the rough, um, lots of value that can be unlocked here, lots of opportunities for global arbitrage and engaging, you know, in what probably is one of the, um, you know, most undervalued asset classes um, in the world right now. Uh, full disclosure, all three funds, the Incubate Fund, the Empower Fund, and the D4V Fund, are open uh, for LP participation. So anybody um, out there um, you know, who is interested, ironically, the fundraising domestically here in Japan is going very well. The fundraising overseas, um, please step it up. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you know, this is the first part of uh, a series, Startup Nation.